Hey gang, so I've got a really cool video for you today. I'm having a chat with Steve and Pauline Richards, of the founders of the Institute for Psychosystems Analysis. And uh, we have a discussion today about how the genome is the biological substrate for the self, which is a real fancy way of saying that our instincts guide us in ways that I think a lot of psychology has not really gotten full grasp of up until more recently. So sit back, enjoy it, like, share, subscribe, and all that jazz, and we hope you like it. Great to see you, Dr. Goodwin, and welcome to IPSA. Yeah. We've been uh, yes. long admirers of your work. And uh, yeah. your books are set readings on our training courses yeah. as well. Yeah. So yeah. great, really great to see you today. Mm. Uh, good to be here. Good to be here. Uh, well, like I was saying earlier, I, uh, I've been really getting into your videos and uh, seeing that you guys think the same way I do. So I really like that. <laughs> How many of us is there? No, there isn't. No, no nothing wrong with that. No. Um, you all, uh, one thing I noticed, you all speak Anthony Stevens. I really like that. Mm. Yeah, we, he was a huge, huge influence on us. And uh, he very kindly wrote a very nice handwritten letter to us in, uh, I think it was February of 1990, supporting us and what we were doing, how we were blending together George Engel's work and the, the Charing Cross model. He was aware of that with mm. Young. And uh, that stayed with us and, and kept us going, didn't it, through some pretty tough times mm -hmm. in the profession. Because now that you, you'll know there's resistance against biology, but, but oh, 30 yes. years ago, it was absolutely terrible. Yes, it was. But anyway, we've got past that now. We have, yes. We, we've fought <laughs> no. a lot of professional battles, but um, we're, we're putting the biology, you know, back in there with the psychology, and it's, yeah. they need one another. I, I think that's where we... We overlap, isn't it, really, in our perspectives? We mm -hmm. value the Well, yeah, because, the, and the, the thing I keep running into is I think there's this uh, fear that if we bring biology into it, that somebody's going to come along and try to reduce the psyche to molecules, and that's yeah. it. <laughs> Sorry. Hear the pipes playing. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> that's my phone. So, but what I was saying is that the, um, what I try to do is to elevate the biology, not to reduce the psychology. Yeah. To, you know, to show the, the divine and the, yes. the magic and the emotion that you can see in the genome, uh, yeah. because it's an incredible, incredible thing. And um, one of your, in one of your videos, and I think in your, hand, uh, your handout that you let me read, um, talks about basically linking the genome with the self. Mm. And uh, I'm, I've really kind of run with that idea. I've always kind of thought that, but I really like the way you put it together. So it, you're getting the wheels turning for me to uh, keep going with that idea. Because so I think you can do a lot with it. Yes. It, it seems to be inevitable that if uh, Jung's psychological is really a, almost a psychologism of the self is real, then it must have a biological substrate. And of course that just led from one thing to the other. And it fitted what we were seeing with with people as well in terms of their lifespan developments. Um, yep, so it seems to be the, the right way to go. Oh, I think so. Um, I've I've been reading for the last couple of years. I've been playing around with the idea of ancestral memory, mm. um, and the the more I think about the genome as a biological basis for the self, the more I can see that it's. Uh, I mean, it's not just a metaphor. It's it's a the, the genome itself carries all of the you know the history of life on it at least in part and life has been around for three and a half billion years yeah. that was the, that's how far back it goes so mm -hmm. and of the four billion species that have existed since then um 99.9 percent .9 of them that are now extinct so we're like the few the proud <laughs> they're yeah. still here <laughs> Yeah. And so that means that the genome must have and just an incredible amount of specificity and information. And, and to hear, when I first started writing, you know, hearing um, theorists say that the genome was not sufficient to carry symbolic information in it, I just like, that's 
crap. That's not, that's not true. Uh, look how much it can do. And, and I think it seems to me that I've run into this with folks that understand genetics, at least on a passable level, but you don't really see the power of it until you dive into it. I'm sure, unfortunately, I guess uh, James isn't here, but I mean, I, I saw in there that he has some um, some expertise in molecular biology, so I, I bet he, you know, he could definitely talk turkey with us. <laughs> but like, there's right now, um, there's this idea of gene and environment co-action being responsible for development and so forth, and and that's great, but it really still doesn't do the deep genome justice, in my opinion, because the genome can transform and change the environment, yeah. but the environment doesn't really change the genome. Um, if it does, we call that mutation. That's bad. That leads to death and, and the end of the genome, right? So um, it's really an asymmetry in those two things. That's an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, the, there's a thing called, uh, well, there's, there's a, a bunch of different mechanisms the genome has to repair damage done to it from the environment to repair it. So like there's this... Um, excision and extraction mechanism that the human genome has. It requires 30 different genes working in concert wow. to go over the genome and re repair any damage that was done to it from, from mutations. Mm -hmm. What people are talking about usually is epigenetic modification. Yeah. Right, so I don't know how much you guys know about that, but the, the word epigenetic gets misused so often. It it is. It is. Yeah. Oh, now we're in epigenetic development. That's not how that works. It's yes. it's um, it's the fact that the genome is responsive to typical environments that it's going to encounter. So there's the, the thing you talk about in your videos that I really love is the uh, that it's always future looking. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Right? It anticipates environments. That's why we have legs and arms rather than fins. Duh. <laughs> why is it so hard to comprehend? <laughs> Yeah, but if you divide the body with from the mind in this rigid sort of dichotomy, then you typically just think, "Oh, that's just the body, right?" And the mind can just do anything and be anything, and yeah. and and that's where you miss that connection with how the genome can influence the psyche. Mm -hmm. But you all talk about on at the at the ground level, like I'm. You're talking the way you you describe some of your interactions with folks. I'm, I'm talking to someone and I'm seeing the genome interacting like right in real time yeah. with an affect or an image or a story, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's, that's yeah. great. I've seen it's that too, but not probably to the extent that you have. It's an incredible thing. And over the years we've learned, mm -hmm. and I've not yet been able to separate myself from this. I haven't been able to disprove it. Should we say that uh, hypnosis is the ideal medium for mind-body so-called interaction and uh, trans states facilitate that informational transduction, opens up the pathways psychoneuroendocrine, psychoneuroimmune and can affect gene expression. And the therapeutic relationship for us is a field phenomenon and it's so sensitive you literally have to dis or we do anyway, we, we, we dissociate, we deliberately dissociate and become participants, observers of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Watch this interaction going so we can register ourselves, register the other, uh, and that flow of information, you can feel changes going on and their physiological changes. Uh, and then various things manifest, which of course Jungians are aware of, but I, I honestly don't think that most of them follow the the implications fully of what that really means uh, of, of how things manifest in mind in consciousness in the moments and where they come from uh, we're very much admirers of pierre Janet. Mm. yeah yeah his dissociative model mm. uh, and i say well, i imagine so if you're you're working with that all the time so you probably see it every day yeah, we, we, we do, and, and we teach it and on the courses, particularly over the, the three years, for that basic, we call it a basic course, um, incrementally build up that, that understanding of what hypnosis is without it necessarily being a formal trans induction. And there's so much you can do in that. 
um, in terms of information gathering and self-monitoring simultaneously. You call it parallel processing. Yes, yeah. There's uh, yeah. such a loss, isn't there, that you can do? There, there is such a loss. And of course, there's so many different schools um, of hypnotherapy. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a broad church in that regard. But I think the beauty of it is, is the speed with which you can get results, mm. that you can turn people around and that you don't... I mean, you'll see a, a whole array of people in, in your work Dr. Goodwin. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess we kind of pride ourselves on reaching a, a, a broad demographic of people too, and the people that we see. And mm -hmm. so we have to be very efficient in, in so much as we have to be very practical sometimes. Mm -hmm. and, and we know that hypnosis can work and work quickly. And so it's, you know, we wouldn't be without it, no. would we? I, if, yeah. if I had to give everything else up, I would before I gave that yeah. up. Yeah. I really mean that now. Yeah. Once I would. No, I, I, I understand. I, I believe you. Um, I mean, we're used to, uh, you know, as people inspired by Jung, I don't know if we're official card carrying Jungians. I don't know. But uh, anyway, we're used to working with dreams all the time. But that's a dissociated state and all that sort of stuff. stuff you know, um, I remember reading this book called uh, The Neuroscience of Religious Experience. And when I went through it, it was this, this was research I did for neurobiology, the gods. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a guy named Patrick McNamara. It's a great book. But um, it talks about the, mo the model of the psyche, very similar to what you're describing, which the, the, the sociability and how you can have multiple cell, possible selves is the way he put it. Um, and anyway, so what, what he was describing there was what goes on in the brain when you have a religious ritual that is uh, designed towards transformation yeah. and you take the current ego and break it down through various means so like you might use hypnosis but then he'd also described uh, using uh, entheogens or repetitive uh, you know like just exhausting sort of repetitive movements drumming all that kind of stuff breaks it down and then these possible selves come up and hopefully <laughs> reintegrate into something that's stronger and more capable and more able to function etc is that is that kind of similar to what you're describing yeah it, it is similar um, mm. because of the the long tradition in hypnosis i mean it is the foundation of all the psychodynamic and even the behavioral schools was systematic desensitization was originally a hypnotherapy method um, a lot of people don't know that. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that either. Yeah, yeah. Joseph Wolf originally developed that as to be used within hypnosis, but a lot of the, the early people weren't particularly good at it, unfortunately. And it's a matter of history, of course, that it frightened Freud. You know, yeah. The strength of the transference, he didn't know how to deal with it. Uh, and Jung had a few unfortunate experiences with it, with transference again, but the kinds of mistakes that they made a beginner now would not make but it's moved on so much mm. that that would never happen mm -hmm. uh, at least with well-trained hypnotherapists because unfortunately it's it's like a loaded gun you know you can learn yeah. to to harm somebody very very quickly with it but learning to to help someone takes a lot of time mm. but um I, I wouldn't be without it uh, for sure but in terms of the dissociability we aim to create, and this is following Pierre Janet, but it's moving on a little bit, uh, an alternative ego position. And we use that very much um, rather than, say, emotionally abreact someone. We create a dissociation so the mm. abreaction is expressed without affect or arousal as such reaching consciousness. Mm. And even the body itself isn't doing anything particularly. But there might be an idiomotor movement, say the movement of a finger or a hand might be shaking like that. And that's it. That's the ab reaction. Uh, the ego is a, a passive observer of what's going on. But what's really going on, we're building a, a, a vessel, this alternative projection of the ego within which to receive the information that's hidden behind the ab reaction, but minus the emotion. So it's the interpretation of a signal that is not met full force by an ego that can't contain it. So we, we get a symbolic ab reaction and then we get the information moved into this safe vessel, which is then integrated and it's coated. It's coated so it doesn't cause any harm. And once it's inside the ego and what we would call the self-concept, it can unpack itself and create reassociation. So it's, it's fully and properly 
integrated rather than it simply being an idea about integration this is a safe way for something to be reintegrated minus the affect mm. but, um, to set that up you you need to build rapport a deep rapport but, yeah process. yeah but um it sounds like a lot of that i mean that's the goal of therapy what you just described it's just yeah. the method of getting there is different from a lot of schools yeah what I teach here is just sort of classic dynamic therapy, general principles. I throw some young in there, um, but that's what, I mean, that's what we're trying to do as well, but we don't, um, since I, I'm not an expert in hypnosis, I don't use it, I don't know it yet, but. Um, you probably do informally, Dr. Goodwin. Uh, that's yeah, that's what I'm saying is that I think I informally use this yes, kind of stuff. Do. Yes. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of times when I'm working with, with folks, I'll, I'll shift the way that I talk and I'll start to have a lulling sort of lilting sort of voice and blah, blah, blah. And I'll sort of lull them into that. And I'll kind of go into it myself too. That's yeah. right. That does happen. Yeah. Right. That, that happens. Okay. Yes. I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad that that's the case. <laughs> if it's supposed to happen. Okay, good. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but then I'll, um, a lot of times too, if I'm not sure what's going on, I'll kind of do that to myself and, and see what it emerges in my own mind. And then, sort of uh, passively suggest it as a possible thing to consider, you know, rather than, you know, I'm interpreting, this is exactly what's going on with you. That, that doesn't work. That bounces right off the ego walls. Yeah. And, but instead to, to suggest it and kind of invite them into this free floating space where we're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, is, is, it sounds like something similar to what you're talking oh, about. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, you're, use, you're yeah. utilizing naturalistic trance states yes. and, and waveforms and harmonic resonance. And, and this is yeah. what the old hypnotists, people like uh, Charcot for sure, but also uh, Pierre Janet, would have called uh, sympathetic resonance. Yeah. It's a field phenomenon. And metaphor is the ideal uh, method of communication because the bandwidth is huge. Mm -hmm. uh, consciousness in the form of the middle number can't take that. It listens, but it can't take it, which means a lot of what's embedded within a metaphor gets past it and it goes directly into the unconscious. Yes, I've noticed that many times. Yeah. Yes. It's a great way to sneak information in. It is, it is, yeah. because the unconscious will make sense of it. And it unpacks the unconscious at that point, and then things change. People say, well, I don't know why I'm changing. Nobody asked me to. Yeah. I got a great example, and maybe this maybe this is what you're talking about. I don't, I'm not sure exactly, but I'll give you an example of something that I did once. I was working with uh, this was back when I was in the Air Force. I had a war vet, yeah. and he had uh, severe trauma from multiple ambushes and so forth. And um, <clears throat> he had this this flipping back and forth between being extremely paranoid and anxious and obsessive, like wanting to clean for hours, to like emotionally numb kind of rage monster. Wow. And he, he couldn't figure out how to get from one end to the other without just, you know, flipping back and forth. And so when he was describing this to me, it's like, he would say, I feel like a, a, you know, a flip switches and I, I go off, you know? And so I, I said, Hmm, okay, well maybe what we need to do is figure out how to put a dimmer switch on that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that stuck because later on we were, it came up and he said, yeah, I feel like maybe I have a dimmer switch on. I wonder where that idea came from. And, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's like, yeah, where did that idea come? Yeah. Man, it's just brilliant. <laughs> Who thought of that? So you're, doing, yeah. you're doing it naturally all the time. That, that, that's quite clear. I mean, that's, that kind of technique will be used in something like NLP for sure. Mm. So, but you know, some people, it's, I think it's true to say some people don't have to be taught as such. And, no. you know, mm. the, the fact that um, you're doing things in that informal way, in some ways is better. I mean, that's the kind of thing that Milton Erickson would have done with language patterning and uh, mm. you know, metaphor and so on. Everything really was, was done um, in, a, in a covert way, um, yeah. which of course, you know, is met with less resistance from people. But the minute that someone comes through the door, you know, the, it, that process begins. Mm -hmm. and, oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah and the, the way that you position yourself and if you yes. where your your eye gaze and theirs and you just you do all of these navigations. Yes, you do. Yeah. And it's 
Yeah. It's hard to teach how to do that exactly. Yes. Yes. Because it's kind of that's where the, I usually just tell my residents that's that's where the art comes in. You know? mm. And I'll explain it, and they'll they'll go yeah yeah yeah, and then I'll watch them, and I'm like, <laughs> we more work to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, everything you do in your life obviously stacks up, doesn't it? In in terms of uh, how you do things, how you relate to people, how comfortable you are with what you're doing, and and all of those things they they all contribute. And I, I think you kind of get to a stage in life where we we call it the barefoot approach, where you literally have to respond to something spontaneously in the moment, and and at that point, sometimes all theory goes out of the window. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and, and something else informs you. Um, sometimes it's the self, for example, right. speaks or, or speaks through you because, you, as Steve was saying, we, we parallel process things and sometimes you, we and, and other people find themselves in situations where they say things with a kind of certainty or authority that they know is, yeah. is not them but they find themselves saying those things nonetheless. And uh, mm -hmm. when those moments happen, they're, they're truly transformative, I, I think, for everyone yeah. concerned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you can't yeah. teach that, you're right. It's, yeah. It's very tough, yeah, it's yeah. very tough. Yeah. Uh, the transcendent function, I guess you might call it, some of that. Yes, yes, Jungians will call it that for sure. Mm, where it takes a life of its own almost um, yeah. that, is a, it's the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, right? It's the thing that happens between, it's a field phenomenon, like you said, it's, that's a great way to put it. I have a physics background, so I, I like metaphors like that, oh, yeah. quantum mechanics and stuff like that, oh, wow. collapsing the wave function and all that. Yeah, it's like, yeah. I, I dig that. <laughs> oh my word. <laughs> yeah, James is very much into that. Yeah. And, um, we're going to be talking to uh, Professor Stuart Hammeroff we are, yes. on the channel as yes. well. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. There's um, a lot, an awful lot there which we're, we're looking into with him you know which, yeah. which is nice i can imagine yeah he's uh i, I read the orchard theory paper okay. yeah. Mm. yeah so i'm familiar with that I, it's been a while since i read it but there was a while there when i was really diving into quantum consciousness theories and um mm. i obviously came across penrose and, and hammeros yeah work great stuff yeah. really interesting yeah. um Henry Stapp's another one. I don't know if you've heard of him. Who, oh, sorry? Henry Stapp. Yeah. No, we're not, yeah. not familiar with him. No, no, okay. Well, he's a physicist who, who also, he comes at it from a different perspective. Yeah. Uh, but it's all, that I was reading that because I was interested in the mind-body problem. And I was trying yeah. to get that sorted. Yeah. It, yeah, it's pretty much inevitable for us, I think, to go this way. And it was really odd because Pauline... Um, She's she's kept everything, you know, way, way <laughs> back from the eighties. Filing cabinets full of old stuff, you know, that, that we were yeah. working on. And I had a little look the other day, and I was surprised at what I was finding. And, and um, we were basically into informational monism at that time, mm. and looking to build a, a model that would be built on that, which was platonic in many many respects. And of course, we we found about Roger Penfold and Stuart Hammeroff's ideas, which are platonic. But they're mm. into the quantum world as well and microtubules. Mm -hmm. um, and we were presently working on what we hope might be a model of quantum psychodynamics. Uh, this is just too much of a coincidence. And um, we reached out. And so we'll, we'll be chatting to him about that. Mm. That's great. That's great. Um, the bridge um, for us will be hypnosis and altered states of consciousness. Are you familiar with any of the work of Harold Atmansbacker? That's a familiar name. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, he he's got a lot of really interesting stuff about um, quantum mechanics and consciousness, and he's also a Jungian himself, right? As right. well. So uh, definitely, he's coming out with a new books too. So uh, that should be fun. Yeah, be fun. Yeah. But the only thing I find with Jungians is that, that they have this aversion to hypnosis, uh, and that they're very much fixed in the past. They say, well. Carl Jung rejected it, so we will, and that. So we must, yeah. yeah. It gets gene replicated or meme replicated down the generations, and they've all rejected something, know nothing about it, which is a great shame. Hmm. Um, it is, it's yeah. considering that, like you said, a lot of people use the techniques informally anyway, so they might as well yeah. formally understand it <laughs> better. They do. I mean, even even alchemy, really, if, if we consider that to be a metaphor for communication between 
idealism and materialism in, mm. in, in broad brush terms between mind and body. Uh, yeah. This is the absolute ideal method of entering into that. Yeah, well, Ernest Rossi really got us into Ernest, that, didn't he, with his yeah. psychobiological yeah. hypnosis, and um, we've yeah. never looked back. No, it's no, just incredible. Yeah. I mean, the, the the actual the actual amount of work that stacks up behind the method is, you know, he, mm. he was second to none, really. I think in terms of his research and talking about informational substances and the various, you know, psycho neuroendocrine so on pathways. Mm. It's it's just it's just so good to have that science behind it. Yeah, he was looking at gene expression yes. and trans states as well. And mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, yeah, he he was a, a supporter of our work, and, and um, I have consulted him. I mean, he uh, he recently died, but long ago it was nineteen ninety nine. He, he was giving me some help with uh, with patients, yeah. um, mm. some of them with, with disease processes. And I'm not making any claim about cures, by the way, in that mm -hmm. sense. But he, but he was very, very helpful with some extremely difficult cases to be, to be able to frame a, mm. a treatment and intervention plan. Very helpful. Yeah, I, um, I've, what I, and this probably connects to what you're, you're talking about some, but I, I'd like to teach our residents that symptoms, even physical symptoms, are communications. Yes. Uh, yes. As a way to try to understand the, mm. the psychological, the symbolic meaning is what, we're after of, of whatever it is, you know, like, uh, and being a psychiatrist gives us, we have kind of an advantage in the sense that we play with the medications, right? So <laughs> if I give someone a medication and they get a weird side effect that makes no physiological sense, then I know I'm dealing with one of these communications. I need to understand it. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of psychiatrists will, well, maybe not a lot, hopefully not a lot, but some will just sort of dismiss that and say, well, you know, that doesn't make any sense. So it must not be possible, you know, so, yeah. but it's a part of their experience, right? So we need to figure that out, yeah. ideally. Yeah. So I look at that as I, if I'm providing a medication and their body is essentially rejecting it, even though they're physically telling me that they want to take it and they want to get better, but their body is saying, I don't trust this. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you some weird side effect that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And, yeah. and so there, that'll show you, you know. <laughs> Yes. So when I when that happens to me, I know I need to start working on rapport, feeling trust, building trust, that kind of stuff. And oftentimes that works mm. really well. Or or I'll shift gears and I'll say, well, let's try a different one, but we'll do a baby dose. Yeah. All right. So I use the dose as a metaphor for intensity. Yes. And that sneaks in there and says, this person is concerned about how I feel. That's what they really want. Mm. really worried about mm. I, I think i think that's mm. what often those symptoms those uh, symptoms and side effects are about they're about i don't i don't really trust what you're trying to do here so and i don't want to say that right because you're the doctor and i don't want to upset you but my body's going to say it yeah and then i can just blame that you know yeah. because they're stuck in this dualistic mode of mind is way over here body's way over there you know they don't realize that it's all like this yes yeah. you know so then I'll, I'll say okay so we're gonna try we're and, and that's when i that's when i go well okay so we're gonna need to try a smaller dose right and i stare you know direct eye contact and <laughs> yes 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 so i'm giving away all my secrets but <laughs> what they really want is to feel listened to right that's just so human yes and yeah. so it's it makes sense and and they they deserve that you know? yeah that's a um, point. yeah you know, and it, it often it often works because that's what they're really after. Yes. Yeah. You meet so many people who um, don't know how to listen. They think they do, but they listen as an ego or an ego to the soma effectively, and it doesn't speak the same language. Mm. Um, that that's a barrier, and we find that with uh, therapy colleagues as well. That's and great. Who, I was, you know, you mentioned about the separation between mind and body mm. conception. Yeah problem with that with young is when they go on about the psychoid boundary that's psycho reductionism and i know that the young said well i can't take my my psychology any further than this so it's no longer psychology the information is gone it's somaticized it's it's in matter it's not anymore well rossi showed that that's not the case it, it it's all about levels levels of analysis description explanation and communication and how each level passes on the same information 
So you get a kind of a super positioning within, a, say, a biopsychosocial stack of something we could call a complex, which is simultaneously uh, congruent in the sense that there is a physiological register, there's a psychological and a psychosocial yeah. register, and it manifests as a profile at all those different levels. But the person's aware of a somatic symptom as a signal, but doesn't know how to talk to it. It talks to it as if it were a person. And what we, we've learned for sure with uh, very deep uh, structure hypnosis is that the, the psyche as such doesn't want to do that. It wants to communicate in a different way. And when we open up that rapport, the signal will change very, very rapidly or it will attenuate completely. And it, it, it's a case of a dialectic, but with different languages. And then the safe space, if you like, that, that, that third option appears between the two. So it's all about moving energy and information around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that tracks. <laughs> that tracks. What I, I what I teach is um, that you have to be able to listen among along multiple channels. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. You, you hear what they say, but then you look at the behavior and and the body positioning and the facial expressions and the tone of voice and uh, it, it's it's a lot to teach because you're. Like you say, it's a large bandwidth, right? You have to be able to listen to whole radio all at once. Yes. Yes. yes Every channel all at once. And then make your mind, you know, make up your mind what you want to do. Yeah. Yes. It's definitely a signal to noise issue, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah it and a figure ground too. Yeah. And, and I have this habit of always going to the ground. I accept the figure because the figures manifest, but the figure can distract. I always go to the ground and I won't understand the figure because there's no context. Mm. And the context in, that, in our way of doing things um, as a psychologically based therapy is always to find out what the ground wants of the figure, which by metaphor is, if we were Jungian in, in orientation, say, for the sake of the uh, argument, we say, what does the unconscious want or what, what's its opinion of the ego, which is the figure standing yeah. on the ground? Because we, we believe it's bigger than that. It's not just that kind of psychoreductive thing. So I always go to the context uh, and accept what manifests and then talk to the context and then it, unusual things happen and people wonder what, 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 what's going on i'm feeling better i don't know why well we, we, we asked somebody else don't you don't you remember we, we we got a second opinion on you from the inside mm -hmm. uh, and <laughs> oh, how, how did that happen well we we, we talked don't you remember we, we talked about a little story and something happened and you were looking a bit puzzled about that wondering what was going on and then something happened within usually within 48 hours. And yeah. James tells us mm. that that's related to the way the genes express, which is interesting. Mm. And I was just going to ask if, if that's if it's a, a way of thinking about talking to the genome, as it were. Yeah. And in the psychological manifestation of it. Yeah. Mm. I mean, you, you can yeah. often and, and this would surprise a lot of therapists think this is impossible, you know, but that's because they're not in the right modality of relating to understand how it's possible. But you can actually get an indication of a day or a date and it may be two or three months downstream and something will happen by then and if you built up mm. the respect so that the the other we'll call it the unconscious agrees i always mm. ask that question i always ask the unconscious is it okay for me to help this person will you allow mm. me to help them and if if it comes back is yes i'm absolutely sure that we will get somewhere Hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you have a, of an example of, of this that you could share with us. Yeah, I mean, I'm so I curious just to, I, I to hear this. I use Chevro's pendulum. Now, I don't overuse it, but I do use it. You know, that, that's the hypnotist. I haven't got it with me, unfortunately. The, the hypnotist uh, pocket watch. Yeah. There are ways of, of calibrating that. And uh, I'm, I guess I'm giving things away now, but <laughs> that's okay. Why not? I, I will always demonstrate this on myself. And it's simple. Uh, you, you hold in such a way that you, 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 your elbow supported, you, your wrist is completely limp, and there's a, there's a pincer grip. You hold the, the T bar on the chain, and you, you, you look at it and you wait for it to, to rest. You take all the twist out, out of it, and then you say something which you know is true. And you, you might look at the person that you're with when you say it, and they say, It's absolutely true that whoever is sitting directly opposite me now, that's absolutely true. And you wait and then it'll move and it's an idiomotor movement which means it's unconscious not <coughs> consciously directed 
but it will confirm it. And very often it's a forwards, backwards movement like that. And I always say, thank you. Always thank the unconscious and building up that connection and say, can you now cause the watch to be still? And we wait and then it slows down and it stops and you say, thank you again. And then you say something which is not true, but you put your absolute best persona lie in place and say, it's absolutely true that so-and-so is in the room. They've just walked in now and they're wearing whatever. And you say it with as much conviction as you can and you wait and it'll move the other way like it's nodding its head. <laughs> <laughs> then you hand it to the person. You ask them to hold it. You tell them how to do it. And then you ask a question. And say, for example, can I talk directly to the unconscious mind of whoever? And you wait mm -hmm. and then it'll come forward. And you say, Thank you. And, and it builds like that. And I always ask the question, is it okay for me to help this person today? And it might go circular. So it's, a, it's ambiguous or there's something that's not been, and you go on like that, eventually you get something and it might say, yes, it's okay. You can do it, you, you know, and basically complete trust. And then I can say with confidence, I have rapport with your unconscious and we, we can make progress. And they felt it, they felt a dissociation. They're still normally conscious, but they're seeing that dissociation play out through an idiomotor phenomenon, the kind of thing that Jung explored and Pierre Janet did when they were looking at complexes. So in essence, we're talking to not the complex, but the homeostatic mechanism, that which regulates all It's outside of their problem. And this is what we say to them. We're not talking to that part of you that's distressed. We're talking to the part of you that wants you to be well. The hidden observer, right? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's another name for it. Yeah. Uh, so are we, sorry, Paul, you're going to say. I was going to say, because yeah. Dr. Goodman was asking uh, to, I think, for, for examples of, oh. of how the unconscious, you know, signals oh, I'm things. sorry. Oh, and yeah, I, was, yeah, yeah. I was just thinking. No, that was, that was amazing. I, I, <laughs> that was great. But I was actually asking for like a, a, a clinical case, maybe. Yeah. That... Yes. Yeah. The, the guy who um, you did. A similar oh, thing with who left and, yeah, and you yeah, watched yeah, yeah. him leave. I, I, I did. You saw the, the traffic lights. It was uh, did this case studies on, mm. on the YouTube, but it was it was a guy who had eczema and he had it on his palms, wrists, and he had it on his ankles, and he'd had it since he was a child. Cut a, a long story short, his mother had handed him a glass of water and some cod liver oil capsules and said, "Take them before you go to school." Well, he's nine years old. And he refused <clears throat> and she said oh you'll be the death of me sent him to school he came home and he found her dead and that was a massive trauma sure uh, and he was in scotland and he was he had to move some 300 miles to two other relatives in england he's with his brother um this was the journey to go and live with, with his, the, his his family and there was a kiosk there and somebody offered him a drink and he reached out and his hands shook violently as a child uh, and he couldn't take the drink he always had to make the drink himself and have it. He could never receive one. And then later he got the eczema. And um, he was very resistant, very, very resistant, very enclosed within himself. And um, I worked with him. I didn't use the pendulum, but we used the communication, the hypnotic style communication channel. And I, I asked his unconscious if it would be all right for him when the unconscious was ready to remember, because he consciously had forgotten all of this. Um, remember what it was, when it would be safe for him to tell me, and then we can move, we can move him on when we can overcome everything in the past as eczema would go and he'd be all integrated. And he was definitely in a trance state because his eyes were bulging at that point. And he gets up and he leaves the consulting room. And it was that night and I watched him. He went down into his car, drove out, he turned left and there were traffic lights, they were on red. He stopped at the traffic lights. I was just watching him, they went green and drove through, turned right. He came back and said, as I went through the traffic lights, when they turned green, it all came back to me. And I was, I was told from within, I can now tell you. And he was crucifying himself. In effect, it was a stigmata through eczema. Mm -hmm. The whole thing joined up and... and it was, it was to cut a long story short, sorted out, but that's the kind of thing you yeah. can do. Mm. And he'd had help, but no one had bothered to try to build the bridge and say, is it safe? Can it be? Right. No. Yes. Mm. I can see. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. Um, and there are others where it's downstream. Yeah. Um, I, I, weirdly, I've even had dreams 
where I've <laughs> where it's been said, not now, in three months' time. You tell the person in three months' time we can we can tackle this. <laughs> and I do. And they say, it's gonna take that long. I said, yes, but you can rest. You don't need to worry. It'll all be sorted out and you don't have to think about it. And then there are other times when you can use metaphor. At the arrival of spring, it, it, it literally walks across a field at, at the pace. We always say of a walking lady. Mm. And it arrives on the south coast of England and it, it walks and somebody might be two days walk away. In two days time, she'll arrive with the spring, that kind of thing. And they go away and two days later, the change happens that they wanted, that kind of thing. There's so much mm. that can happen. Once you have that rapport mm. field built and you interact and you feel it, you can do an immense amount. So the, the dissociation, at least temporarily, of the ego from, I guess, itself, maybe, yeah. yes, uh, is what you need. You have to teach someone to uh, disengage from willing things to happen within the psyche and just rather allow them to spontaneously emerge. Yeah. 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 Much like a dream state. It is like a dream. Yeah. yeah. Mm. We know myths, they're like dreams, dreams of cultures, as Jung said. But we, we, we have a, a slightly different way of looking at dreams than, than a lot of Jungians do. We're very interested in the continuity between the waking ego and the dream ego and the perspectives they have. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we, we teach our students about working mm. with dreams, and we don't push dreams. We don't even invite them, but we always take them when they appear. And that way we, we get mileage out of what we get. You know, right. if you overuse this, it, it starts to just become a joke. You see the tricks are coming through and all sorts. But right. what, what we would what we do do is that, that, that basically they share one thing, the dream ego and the waking ego uh, share the self-concept. That, that is to say the autobiographical memory and everything that's been associated to it. Right. But when the, the waking ego slips into the dream ego stays, along with the identity of that is me, you also get all of those complexes which are most closely associated to the ego at that time, and they're pulled in with it. Yes. They, have, they have as little say in the matter as, the, as the, the dream ego does. There's something else which is operating, which provides the scenario, the narrative, and the complexes are forced to act out in the same way the dream ego is. Uh, whereas the Jungians tend to follow uh, Jung and say the complexes are the architects of dreams. I don't think they are at all. I think they're pulled into it every bit as much. And the, the, the regulation is on a much higher scale. And it's basically homeostatic. And we're seeing yeah, that yeah. trying to be worked through. And that's one reason why we don't have to work with dreams most of the time. Because mm -hmm. what's acted through is the image of a metabolic process. That's at one level physiological, and another level it's psychological being represented in imagery whilst the brain is in a dreaming state. And we don't normally have to pay any attention to it, but when it's not sufficient, it can't be dealt with at that level, we do have to do something. And then the ego is tasked with adaptation. So that's you know the way that we generally look at them. And also, as you've said in, in your books, um, and particularly in the neurobiology of the gods, I find that a very impressive uh, thing about just how many dreams are instinctive in nature. Mm -hmm fundamentally yeah. mm -hmm. when, we, when we look at that that's what we see we see that the, yeah. the narrative of the dream is fundamentally instinctive uh, and that, that oh, yeah was, yes uh, that's right. it's the the self and or the gene the genome <laughs> orchestrates it and there's always this, this debate about whether or not whether or not it's uh, you know coming from your lived experience or whatever but um the thing i've noticed and this you can see in in uh, studies of memory is that um, number one memory is it's largely imagination mm. it's, it's really not a retrieval process and all these computer metaphors that they use it's a bunch of baloney yeah. it's yeah. it's you you basically create it with yeah. your imagination yeah. Yeah. and it's loosely based on what actually happened yeah. <laughs> more or less yeah. but it's orchestrated towards emotional goals and mm. and self so you're much more likely to remember accurately if it's emotionally intense and it has to do with you. Yeah. So yeah. that makes perfect sense. So but the way I teach this is that that same process, memory consolidation, which is in a lot of dream literature, 
is going on in dreams, only the dream is not concerned so much with what happened. It's more concerned with what does what happened mean? And it uses symbols to depict that. Yeah. But it takes things that have happened to you and it breaks them up into pieces and then rearranges them into these archetypal structures. That's where the instinct comes in. Yeah. And so like, um, I remember I was discussing this with uh, someone once and they were talking about the red book mm. and they were pointing out that in the red book, the picture, the pictures of Philemon, the face, it looks, looks like Freud basically, you know? Yeah. And so they were saying, yes, okay. So this is the, the personal stuff. And whereas young was always talking about it being archetypal, but it's really all this personal stuff, you know? And I said, yeah, but, but Freud didn't really wear robes and fly around on wings, did he? No, that stuff is the archetypal stuff. And so, yeah, it takes bits and pieces of your own experience, but it arranges it according to its own rules, mm. right? It doesn't, it, you don't get dreams that exactly repeat experience, except in the case of severe trauma. Mm. And that's pathological. That's because you're stuck in the conflicts, right? You're stuck in the past. But more often than not, it's taking what happened at the day residue, right? But it doesn't ever verbatim repeat it. And, you know, and Jung recognizes, he talks about this in his books. He says, uh, it's so easy for people to say, oh, I dreamed about walking across, uh, you know, 11th Street. And, you know, I did that yesterday. So that's why I had that dream. Okay. Well, what else was going on? Did, did that happen too? Usually not. Yeah. Yeah. Usually not. And so then I wonder, well, why is that there? You know, and then the other thing about dreams is the way that, like, you, I love the way you put it, because something in there is orchestrating it. Yeah. And it is not you. No. Yeah. Yeah. You don't go to sleep saying, I want to dream about, you know, X. Yeah. You just sort of find yourself in this em environment and it's incredibly realistic. Mm -hmm. And who came up with it? Right, and then stuff happens, and you interact with it. But who came up with that part? It isn't you. So what I tell my residents when I'm usually the first first class or so is, you need to think about that. And if it doesn't disturb you, we haven't thought about it enough. <laughs> it should be disturbing to you that that happens every night. <laughs> Which is, of course, right where the idea of the invisible storyteller comes from. But it's it's my way of of giving a new name to the self. Really, that's what it is. Yeah. And it's all do oriented towards individuation. Yes, yes, yeah. So it's kind of disturbing and reassuring at the same time in a way. Yeah, Isn't it's it? meant it's kind of a tongue in cheek joke, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's disturbing because you normally think everything that goes on in my head is because I put it there yeah. or because I learned it. Yes, yeah. But the big lesson of, of depth psychology is yeah. especially Jungian oriented is that 99% of what's in there wasn't put in there by you or your experience. <laughs> it came from the genome, yeah. it came from the self, it came from all of this instinctive processes. Yeah. That's, that's um, yeah. very much in line with ancestral memory and I'm really interested mm -hmm. to hear your thoughts on that. Well, yeah, um, so if, if you look at, say, I start off with something very simple, like uh, the, the E. coli organism. Very simple. And it has, it has in, the, in its own little tiny genome, um, this thing called the lac operon. I don't know if you've heard of this or not. No? No, it's in that detail. No. <laughs> not that detail, okay. Well, it's, it, without getting too lost in the weeds with it, it's yeah. basically E. coli likes to eat glucose. That's its favorite food. Nice. But sometimes it doesn't have that. And so if that's the case, then the lac operon, which is a collection of genes, will, um, it has, it sends out these proteins that detect whether or not there's glucose or lactose in the environment. If there's lactose, it turns off the glucose eating proteins and turns on the lactose eating proteins. Okay, so you might think, well, big deal. But it is a big deal because where did the E. coli learn how to do that? Yes. It didn't, it's, it's embedded in the genome. So now this is called epigenetic modification. That's what it really is when the environment modifies how the genome behaves. But even saying it like that, saying the environment influences the genome 
is a bit misleading because what's really going on is that the genome is testing the environment and saying what's out there that I know I already, already know that I need. And if this isn't, this isn't there, but this is, then I'm gonna shift and grab that. So it is responding to the environment. It's not necessarily being influenced by the environment. So even in this case, if you look, look at it as gene environment co-action, mm. it's kind of like saying that um, the statue of David is Michelangelo and stone lump co-action. Yeah. Right. It, it's, it doesn't really make a good explanation. Yeah. Michelangelo is behind it all, right? Yeah, he needs rock. He needs a lump of stone to work with. Mm. But the, the genome has something the environment doesn't have, and that's an agenda. Yeah. And the environment is just sitting there, right? The, but the genome has an agenda, right? It's going to test the environment. It's going to be constantly monitoring all this stuff, and it can happen throughout the lifetime. Yeah. This is another thing that drives me bananas is it can only be a native if it's there at birth. Yeah. I hate that <laughs> because, because it's so dumb, right? Because <laughs> what, what in the world does that matter, whether it's at, at birth or not? Secondary sex characteristics is usually the only thing I have to mention. It's like, okay, that happens 10, 12 years after birth. Yeah. Yes. It has nothing to do with what you experienced. So, time to, you don't learn how to do that. It just kicks in. Yes, yeah. yeah. it's on the clock, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Exactly. It's on a clock. Yeah. And I think that the, the more that I look at this, the more I think what's going on is we encounter a certain scenario. The genome, the genome metabolizes it. And this is where I think people run into troubles because I'm crossing the mind-body barrier with that sentence that the genome is processing what's happening to me psychologically, is, you know. Mm. But then it responds and it responds with an instinct, just like the lack of operon. It didn't need to be learned. It's already there. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it's in, and it's there, but it's there because of our massive evolutionary history. Um, so uh, the way I put it, you know, the genome is, your genome is basically the latest reproduction of something that started 3.5 billion years ago. And, you know, that's lots of different species. If I go back far enough, I'm, I've got a fish as an ancestor. Yeah. You know, that's kind of weird to think about, but it's, it is true. Yeah. 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 But we don't necessarily have to go far that far back. Mm -hmm. um, humans have been around for 200,000 years. So even that is an unimaginably large amount of time. And that's all within the same species. So it's been a long time to refine all of that stuff. So I think what happens, we run into in a situation, the genome metabolizes it, processes it. It doesn't matter wh where we are in life, it'll produce it. And yeah, what we've experienced will overlay that, but the ultimate source of it is the genome. Yeah. And it'll be a dream, it'll be a feeling, it'll be who knows what. Um, and when I say ancestral memory, I'm, I'm basically looking at um, the different layers. That I have five different layers that I've divided up into. Right? Mm. So the, the deepest layer is the one that we share with every mammal and reptiles and birds. Mm. Okay, and that's just, there's, a, there's a, a handful of genes that are responsible for creating the ability to integrate sensory information and make a decision of what to do. So obviously any animal needs that. Mm. So that goes really far back. Then above that is the reptile brain, which um, hangs up and Anthony Stevens talk about a lot. Great stuff. Mm. Uh, so I, I don't need to explain that guy to you, to you guys. You already know about that. But those are all very much in there. And then you've got the social layer that deals with all of the mostly human stuff, like uh, instincts to learn a language, instincts to be concerned about your social status, and all of that stuff that goes on with the social dynamics. I think all that's instinctive. Mm. Yeah. We're very intensely social animals, and if we don't have, if we don't have the right, if we don't feel like we're a part of a tribe or something, we feel intense loneliness. But other animals don't do that. Yes. Like solitary animals, like tigers or bears, they don't care what other bears think about them. You know, in the wee hours of the night, <laughs> that doesn't occupy their minds. They don't give a crap. <laughs> but we're not that, right? We're not that. We're always worrying. Why? Well, uh, well, it's because we we cooperate to survive. So that's our, we put all our eggs in that basket. So that's gotta be instinctive too. Yeah. 
right? And then there's the cultural layer. Um, this would be things that have influenced our genome from not just 200,000 years ago, but in between that and say maybe 9,000 years ago. Um, so like what a couple of examples of that would be body type based on where most of your ancestors are from. You know, if you're mostly from Northwestern Europe and ancestry like I am, so you kind of have the long torso and you've got, you know, a body type that's more adapted to colder climates and light skin and all that kind of stuff, light colored eyes. Mm. That's an adaptation too. And it's, it's from that more recent ancestral history. The, the question is, does any of that translate into the psyche, which I don't think any studies have been done on this, but anecdotally, I've certainly experienced what I feel like mm. is related to that. Mm. Uh, particularly when I first came back to when I came back to, when I first visited Ireland, I didn't come back to it. I'd never been there, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. my genome had been there yeah. for, uh, uh, you know, for, uh, I did the 23 and me. So I knew that some of the genomes had been there for 9,000 years. Yes. And so I did, and this was after I had first, I had first visited it. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of these weird deja vu experiences that went there. And I was like, man, I feel like I've been here before, but I know I've never been here before. And that's just bizarre. I didn't know how to process that and until later I was thinking maybe it's some kind of ancestral memory you know maybe it's something that embedded itself and that this environment triggered a response mm -hmm. just because of the sheer thousands of years of exposure at, along certain of my own you know family lines yeah. mm -hmm. so then the final layer is the transgenerational layer so that would be intergenerational transmission of trauma which I know you guys have probably heard of Mm. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And that's pretty well known, but nobody knows how to explain it exactly. There's some, some people think that it's um, epigenetic transmission of information. So um, that would be DNA methylation, uh, amongst other mechanisms, where something traumatic can happen to you, but your grandchildren can still be affected by it. Yeah. So that's part of ancestral memory, too. Mm. Uh, right on up to middle you know, mom and dad. <laughs> mm. So that's my layers. That's how I parse it out. Mm. And all of that stuff is operating, I think, and can emerge and respond at any point. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, yeah. we, uh, we work with this by different names, but mm. certainly the same observations and perspectives uh, clinically. And very often, that's absolutely what you need to access in order to blow, and I'll use it metaphorically, blow complexes away. Yeah. To, to, to blow individual relatively recent learning is to is to hook into that that row I very often say that I very often ask people to look over their shoulder and see the line that if it's a man the line of men back over the horizon mm -hmm. and are they all nodding or are they doing that you know yeah. it, metaphorically because being in a line with your instincts in that way and with your ancestry and people say oh well I, I did not like my parents I didn't like my grandparents that's just two generations yeah. Yeah. As you said, your genome is ancient mm. and it's pretty much think that we've experienced this meaningful has been experienced before. And the metaphor is looking back, but it's also looking within because of the expression of those instincts through the genome in the present. And instincts always look forward. Complexes always look back. Mm. So let's look forward. I love that distinction. <laughs> uh, it's so it's so accurate. You know, I, I never knew that I knew that until you said it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's true. I never realized that, but yeah. They, they want you to go back. They, they want you to be infantile. They want you to be to be fixated. And there's so many therapists who will do inner child work or say this is because of a Kleinian issue over whether you, are, you were breastfed and whether that was favorable or not. And <laughs> it does not help. It's, that. Yeah, it, it, it's neurotic because it causes it's the ego to split yeah. and it, it generates trouble in the self-concept as well. No, that's disintegration. Mm -hmm. Integration means alignment and purpose of action forward, knowing you're connected to the past in a healthy way. Yeah, and, and the fact that the genome anticipates environments is so important to this. Yes. This is not just there to build a body that you then fill in with whatever and it's completely meaningless and arbitrary. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> no, the genome is like, you're moving forward, you need to move forward, and if you're not in line with that, but we do have free will, right? I, I think Jung was correct to say the ego is a center of autonomous center of consciousness, mm. but then so is the self. 
Yeah. But sometimes they're going in different directions and you yeah. get big problems. Mm. Well, that's, that's what we call an individuation neurosis, basically, is where the anticipated trajectory of lifespan developments on that clock of time release, as you were mentioning earlier, the intentionality, yeah. say, is vertical, and then something happens and we go. And the angle between those two is basically that which defines the individuation neurosis. But someone can get realigned with the intentionality of the gene and they will start to adapt very quickly. Mm -hmm. but the things that get in the way are complexes and complex social relationships and how they're internalized. And then they become part of ego identified complexes that sit in the self concept. And because we have a social brain, we tend to project internally that and expect the psyche to operate as a mirror of the outer world on the inside. And therapists get you to talk to these things that are fantasies. And in our experience anyway, that, that slows things down uh, by generating too many targets. Mm. And most of them are mirages. Mm. But that essential connection on the inside, you then get a myth emerging from within, like a spontaneous dream that mm. will be, as you've put it, I've heard you say this, the, the stickiness of that, which is within, yeah. that, that mm. keeps a good myth alive. Uh, then the resonance is true. So we haven't internalized a collective myth, which is not us. It's a fantasy. We generate something which finds its resonance uh, elements in the environment, and then we connect mm -hmm. that to the genome mm. we're on our way yeah couldn't agree more <laughs> good stuff isn't it? I, I i really admire you and, and your work i think it's absolutely fantastic and i we both think this we, we see you as part of this new generation that are paving the way for the future it's it's, it's, it's great you know it's really great to mm. talk to you and to learn from you we oh, same here same here I've, I've learned a lot from from you guys so this is really cool I, I try to learn from everybody I run into yes yes yeah. it's, best, it's best to be open in that it way is. isn't it and uh, just just uh, going back for a moment to the idea of instincts and, and ancestral memory where we're using those ideas a lot with because a lot of the people we see for whatever reason tend to be young men they don't do. they yeah, the moment, uh, yeah. particularly with coming out of lockdown as well yeah. And some of, sort of the, the, the Paleolithic ideas about being locked in, you know, into the cave and mm. um, that idea of reaching back into the past and using that to get them to see just how important it is for them to get outside of the cave and, and to... Um, it, it's that uh, hunter-gatherer thing, really, yeah. to get them out there and get their seeking system engaged and getting them hooked back up to life. And we, we find that's incredibly helpful, we particularly do. with young men. Oh, yeah, especially with young men, you're going to get a hunter imagery. Yes. Ad nauseum. I, I went through the same thing when I did my own therapy. It was constantly there. Yeah. And uh, not that women can't do that, of course. They, of oh. course they can, but it, it tends to be very... It does very strong in, in, in young men. Yeah. Cause, and that's those instincts, right? It's like, you got to get out there and you got to, you got to see, you got to find, you got to hunt, right. seek the mysteries and, you know, unlock the, the resources, <laughs> go on a quest. Yeah. Right? That's the quest. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 It's, it's foundational, isn't it, for the West? The, 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 oh, sorry, I was thinking about the Arthurian idea of you and the land are one, that kind mm. of thing, and the extension oh. of that. And, See, well, I was just thinking that exactly the same thing. <laughs> Arthurian myth. I love the Arthurian myth. Maybe we'll, we'll talk about that one these days. Yeah, but I, I really love John Borman's movie Excalibur. That, that's uh, that, that's a that's a mm. view that really is powerful. Yeah. Very yeah, we, cool. we find uh, on the Paleolithic side, don't we, Paul? Yeah. That particularly for young men, if we're talking about young men. Mm. The, uh, the early imprinting with the mother, so we don't go there too much and get lost in all the Kleinian stuff and even some of the Freudian psychosexual stuff or the Oedipus mm. or whatever. Mm. Simply to, to to say that for a boy, it seems, uh, in under those those conditions, that the relationship to the mother confirms for him how he relates to himself internally, not the outer world, but the inner world and that world of bonding and first forming a relationship. So mm. downstream of that then, if uh, a boy has been taught by his mother not to trust her, he's unlikely to trust his unconscious or his psyche. And that with men, you generally know how they're going to treat the unconscious by how they treat women. And that's a throwback, it seems. So that's mm. like the, the, the idea of the cave and the Paleolithic. So the mother's the cave and right. the young man should start, stand at the cave mouth with his father. 
It's his father's job to say, that is the world, and I'm, I'm handing you the knowledge of the horizon. Yeah. 360 yeah. degrees, that savannah is yours, if you know. And then if he's not been properly inducted by his father, he will not trust the outer world, and he'll retreat back into the cave. And if his relationship to his mother's not been that good, he will be lost inside those formations and uh, mm -hmm. archaic, dark thoughts. Uh, and, and then you see a typical neurosis that, that, that forms around that. So we tend to concentrate on those primary relationships in that Paleolithic way and, and try to get people to begin a confirmation process that moves them away from being fixated on those in the past, but still access, as you say, for ancestral memory, mm -hmm. the, the open savannah, Mm. and being completely free right because getting stuck in your own personal past is different from accessing the ancestral ancient past yes, it is. yeah right because that's where the guidance comes from the ancestors the the spirits yeah. the gods whatever you want to call them yeah and that's why they exist isn't it the, yeah. these these uh, myths and, and these ritual practices because mm. so many young men are lost because the fathers either weren't right for them or the mothers were wrong for them in whatever combination and their hesitance at the cave mouth, the savannah's there, but they don't trust that because the father wasn't there. And they look back in the cave and it's dark because mm. they can't trust the mother either. Yeah. And that darkness is their inner darkness. You know, yeah. the young would have called it a negative anima. But, mm. but you try to help them to align with that ancestral idea, but look forwards uh, and then feel that they can go out into that savannah. Right, because then you're, you're calling on the, uh, on the help of, of all of those fathers and mothers. Yes. yes. Not just not just pinning all of your hopes and dreams on one mother yeah. or one father, which nobody can possibly yeah. contain all of that no. need. Mm. Where in a, in a society where a lot of times I think that stuff was distributed amongst many adults. Yeah. Uh, but we in modern culture, at least in the West, we don't have tribes and villages and all that sort of thing. Everybody's hyper individualized, you know, yeah. and so that that's a problem. Mm. All of that gets projected on the parents, which they can't contain that. No. Even no. if they try their best, they, you yeah. know, yeah. they're always going to fall short. Yes. yes. It's, inevitable. Mm. it's inevitable. No matter mm. how good you try to be, mm. you'll never do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Deep stuff. Yeah. It's good though, isn't it? It's great. Yeah. It's, it's, it's meaningful. Uh, and mm. you feel that it's meaningful and people's lives transform for the better. You know, you, I think then you see the, what the psychopomp should be that they come into someone's life and they don't possess someone but they get out as soon as possible and leave the victory with with the individual yeah <laughs> but it's been great talking to you and i really i'm sure pauline just said we, we both really look forward to talking yes. to eric again yes absolutely. And, and we really yeah. look forward to you joining us at ipsa as well have a fantastic future looking forward to it yes speaking of moving forward right yeah yeah it'd be great maybe uh dr goodwin would like to join us with uh professor hammeroff when yeah he turns absolutely. Up as well. you absolutely. know obviously it's yeah entirely up to yourself but you'd be very welcome yeah yeah you'd be welcome and i'd love to do that and uh then El Vite as well. Oh yes, we haven't forgotten them. <laughs> <Look at> that. <laughs> they're, they're great. Very interested to see what they have to say. Oh, they're, they're lovely people. They're, they're lovely. I, I know you'll get on with them. Yeah. You, you're oh, okay. a person as well, so you've got you're on the same wavelength, you know. Oh, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes sense. It's perfect. Yeah, and you know your mythology too, which is great because they're into that and, and they live it. So yeah. that, that's that's mm -hmm. fabulous. Yeah, I bet they are. <laughs> So um, we'll, we'll see you very soon. And thank you for your time. I know you're at work and you have a busy clinical practice. So blessings to you, doctor. It's been great to meet you. And we'll speak again very soon. Very soon. Wonderful. Thank you thank so you. much. Wonderful to talk. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you.